Hello and welcome to Linux Lads, episode 127. As usual, I'm Shane, joined by Connor this week. Hello. And unfortunately, Amalith and Mike aren't here. They're both moving house. So, uh, you know, they're pretty busy at the moment uh, with house stuff. So hopefully they'll be back next time. This week, it's just me and Connor. And uh, we are just going to talk about, you know, random stuff we've been up to for the last few weeks, like an old school episode. What do you think? (laughs) (laughs) Very old school. So... Just to get it out of the way early, um, Linux Lads is supported by our listeners via our PayPal donation link and through our coffee. So that's ko-fi. If you'd like to support us, go to coffee.com slash Linux Lads. Again, ko-fi.com. If you want, we'll even read out your message on the show as an added bonus because you get to leave a little message with your donation. Uh, we also have a store where you can buy t-shirts, mugs, log- with our logo on it if you want something in return for money at store.linuxlads.com. At if you have any suggestions, feedback you want to share with us, you can contact us on show at linuxlads.com or join one of our groups. We're on Telegram at uh, linuxlads.com forward slash Telegram and that's Bridge to Matrix if that's more your thing. Uh, you can find all of our links at linuxlads.com forward slash contact which will be linked in the show notes as well. So anyway. I have been in love with the Z code editor. It was kind of to publish my website that I published recently and I've been getting into game development and stuff like that. And I discovered Z through this. And uh, basically what it is, is a code editor written in Rust and it has an emphasis on being really, really fast. And it's written by some of the devs who worked on Atom, which was popular a number of years back. And I've been in love with it mainly because it looks amazing. It looks so nice. Uh, The font... The fo- like the font choices, the colors, the design and everything. It just looks really nice on your screen. And it's very easy to work with, unobtrusive and doesn't blind you with colors too much. It, it's very understated. So it's like it claims to be like an IDE hiding in a text editor, which is perfect for me because Visual Studio Code is way too much. And uh, there's a bunch of little tiny menu options in Z that you can get to if you want to go, go to them. You know, they're very small, they're very unobtrusive. VS Code has that to some extent, but there's an awful lot of stuff in it that I just don't need or don't know how to use. So I'm perfectly happy with something kind of minimal and, you know, understated. You, As you're talking there, it's, you're like... It did sound vaguely familiar. It's like based on uh, Rust by the original Atom people. Uh, and then I was like doing a quick kind of web search in the background. And I'm like, yeah, I think I did try this out um, very briefly. It it does seem to be com- quite compelling. Uh, I don't do a lot of uh, very advanced text-related stuff. My text-related stuff is you just like config files or whatever and like uh kate is more than enough for that uh i don't do a lot of kind of text edit uh like development or code text editing but yeah it's uh any time that i have poked around to it with it it seems um seems to do the job one thing is for people who are uh, a bit wary of these things uh, when you go on their website, I'm just seeing, seeing here, the Linux install instructions is literally just a, a curl to an install.sh uh, off, their, off their website. I'm sure it's perfectly fine, but if you do not trust that, I can completely understand why you wouldn't trust that. There's also a drop down that says there's other ways to install it. One of them is from Flathub and it's in various different repos such as uh, Fedora, Arch, uh, Solus, Manjaro, um, it's in a various different, uh, repos as well. So you don't, if you don't trust the curl install sh script, uh, which, w- which would make sense. There's other ways to install it. I curled straight into bash. I have no <laughs> regrets. I went, I went raw dog with my curl. Yeah, I, I don't know. It, it's, it, it, it's, it was fine. You know, <laughs> it was fine. I noticed on their site they have this speed claim and I th- it was measured in milliseconds and I was kind of doubtful about that. But I found out an interesting fact just tr- through this code editor is that the claim speed is noticeable. Apparently, as we we as humans can detect a 20 millisecond difference in keystroke latency. And I was like, huh, that's kind of cool. Um, like 20 milliseconds, like 20 one thousandths of a second. And... I was a bit dubious until I started using it and I was like, I don't, I can't see it happening, 
but it's different like to other text editors like i I noticed a more of a crisp kind of response and apparently that 20 milliseconds makes all the difference i mean i i've any time that i've experimented with text with uh, these code editors um there is like VS Code, which is essentially based on Electron, and they say Electron is is not exactly the slimmest, fastest thing. It's it's perfectly fine. And then you install something like Sublime Text, that, which I think is written in either C or C plus plus or something like that. Some Sublime Text is like lightning fast compared to it. It's like so responsive, and so it would make sense that something uh, written in Rust would be something similar because Rust is one of the the languages that are they're kind of like okay, uh, we're going to do modern real implementation of what C and C++ is doing, and other ones will be like Go from um, originally from Google. Mm. But yeah, it's like more lightning fast. It's like a, a, a modern version of C and C++, I suppose. Yeah, exactly. Like Rust is, is that language where everyone, like a few years ago, I remember going to, going to see talks and there was so many people going on and on about Rust and they were telling me why it was great and I was like, I don't understand anything. But, you know, whatever. <laughs> as long as it makes applications this quick, I'm I'm all for it. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I wish I had more th- something more to contribute, but I'm not really a, a coder or, or anything like that. Uh, I just ba- do basic text editing, which mm. Kate or Gedit or whatever the whatever they've renamed it in, in GNOME um, is perfectly adequate for that. Uh, in the command line, I use Nano. I don't use uh, anything fancy like Vim or anything like that. Um, yeah, so. I'm, I'm team team Nano as well. I get it. Um, the re- the reason I was sort of doing all of this was uh, like I was saying before we started recording that I've gone down quite a few rabbit holes in the last few weeks. I was into note taking and having like a personal knowledge management system and all this stuff in obsidian and i've been really using that quite a lot and installing all the plugins and indexing all my notes and all this stuff then the the newest the newest obsession in now is uh, is game dev so i've been experimenting a lot with godot game engine over the last few weeks and uh, that's been frustrating i won't lie <laughs> like game development is very very frustrating but uh when you do figure out the issues that you're having it's really, really, really like gratifying. It's it's like the best sort of uh, the best feeling you'll you'll ever ever get. Well, that I've ever gotten anyway. <laughs> like throughout like messing with technology, it's like because uh, it's so difficult. Like the last few days, I've been trying to get a pause menu working properly, and you'll follow a tutorial, you'll do something, you'll type a few lines of code, and be like, oh great, it works. But wait a second, the pause menu is there even when the game is not paused. <laughs> you know? And then it's like, oh great, it's working, it's disappearing, it's not on the screen when I when it's not paused. Uh but now the buttons don't do anything. You know? <laughs> you know? It's just like and that'll continue in different combinations for about two hours, and then you'll finally just find one little line of code that was the problem the whole time, and then it'll and then you're like, Yes, yes. <laughs> it's the best feeling ever. So that's been me. And of course, you know, I've always been a long time Blender user, so I'm proficient enough in Blender. I wouldn't say I'm like necessarily good at it, but I'm more than a beginner at this point. Mm-hmm. I know how to do some useful things in it. So I've been creating uh, tiled level assets for, for Godot and that, which is like super, super cool. Like you can create like cool science fiction corridors and like interiors of spaceships and stuff like that because that's my whole thing and you can just import those into godot and you can put like you can put tiles so you can actually it's like your own little level editor you can use a grid map node in godot and you can literally just put down tiles and just make corridors levels you can add your assets that you've created elsewhere and just like plunk them into the scene and then if you want to do some coding you you do have to script things quite a bit uh but the scripting is actually quite straightforward like it's not super difficult if you've uh if you've never really coded professionally for instance i haven't i mean not since college really just dabbled but it's uh it's really really fun like it's incredibly fun and even if it's probably going to go nowhere i'll probably be on something else in four weeks time (laughs) but uh, it's definitely fun so tell me, Connor, you got a very, very small computer. Um, yeah, so uh, 
I'm sure pl- plenty of people out there in the geek universe are familiar with this uh, company, but I got a, a mini form mini PC. Uh, it cost me just over 400 sterling uh, because I ordered it from the UK website, mainly because it will come with the right plug and everything like that. Uh, they don't have an Irish website, so I did order in, in Great British Brown Sterling. It got delivered from Hong Kong and arrived in about a week, um, which was actually pretty good going. The, the FedEx priority shipped it over. Um, it is a, oh, and we'll put the exact spec or of the, of the model in the show notes, but it's like a 12th gen Core i9, uh, 20 thread CPU with like 32 gigs of RAM and a 512, uh, NVMe SSD built into it. It came with Windows, which was uh, immediate, almost immediately wiped off. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I booted it up, and what I normally do with um, when it gets something new that has Windows st- installed on it, I'm like, well, Windows is the supported operating system. I might as well just boot it up once and like get all of the BIOS updates and all of that malarkey out of the way so that at least I know it's been done properly once. And then it got to a stage where it's like, uh, to proceed further, please uh, log in with your Microsoft account. I went, yeah, fuck all of this shit. I just wiped it. <laughs> just, <laughs> like, I was like, you had your chance. You had your chance, Windows. Now you're forcing the, the, the Microsoft account down my throat. So then I wiped it immediately. I started off with Proxmox. For those who are unfamiliar, it's kind of like a free and open source version of VMware. Like it's like it's a it's a virtual machine management system, mm. and it's based off Debian, and it's, it's perfectly fine. That installed okay, detected everything. I was experimenting away, and it it does LXE containers. So my idea was that I will have a uh, Jellyfin in a container. And I also, um, off Amazon, I just went and I uh, bought a four terabyte SATA SSD because there was this, there's a SATA adapter in the box with it. So you can, I, I was like, fine, connected mm. all that up. I'm not a hugely technical person, to, um, which may surprise some people. So in my bumbling around and looking up um, forms and everything like that, for the life of me, I could not figure out how to get the Jellyfin in the LXE container to detect the four terabyte additional four. I could detect the internal drive, no problem. Uh, so I was, I was messing around and I was following all forms and researching and doing web searching and everything like that and even recruited some help from our local Linux community and say hey guys like anyone who's familiar with this and we actually jumped on a uh, Jitsi meet so I could share my screen and they're like okay SSH into it which I did and they're like okay do this command do LX be okay, do everything, just like list out everything, show me the permissions. Like there were several evenings where they graciously lent me their, their time and we're still like bashing our heads up, up against the wall, still not able to do it. And then uh, after a while, it's like, uh, you could tell that the, the guy was uh, trying to help me out, but he's getting frustrated that he couldn't help me out. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't the case of, I kept saying, Thank you for your time. Like you're being very, and he said, "No, no, no, don't, don't worry, worry, worry about that." Like there's a problem. I want to fix it. There's a problem. I want to fix it. <laughs> so I felt bad because I was, I was, I was asking for his time, like m- on, over multiple evenings, and he's, he's like, "No, no, no, don't, no, I don't mind that." It's, it's almost like, I'm here to, help, I'm here to help because there's a problem and I must fix it. And so he was getting frustrated, and uh, after all of that. Um, I think we got part of it working and then I was like, oh, well, I'm on my PC. I would like to be able to just drag my, because it's Jellyfin, I would like to be able to drag just my media over to us. So I was like, do we set up some kind of network share? What about Samba? And, like, <laughs> and even that wasn't the most straightforward. It wasn't the easiest thing. Uh, so after several evenings of that, and I was like, well, even if we got this working to my satisfaction, what if something goes wrong? We, I've, I've just gone through this whole <laughs> technical thing where he needed help. Am I going to call this guy up again, or like I would? I probably won't be able to figure it out myself. I mean, I learned. I was learning bits along the way, like he was showing me different bits and pieces. But I was like, how much of information of this am I going to be able to retain? So, and then I was like, <laughs> well, if I'm going to fi- be able to figure this out myself, I'm, I'm going to have to do something easier. So I heard that you can uh, virtual machine management. Is nice to have, but I was like, 
do I really need that? What I kind of want is just containers that I'm able to run Jellyfade or Photo Prism or whatever I want to run in containers. So I just wiped it and put Open Media Vault on it. And Open Media Vault supports through their plugins Docker Compose, and you can just set up Docker, Docker containers rather than LXE containers. So currently, uh, I was able to do that, and I got way more towards my goal than I did using Proxmox. I have Jellyfin running in a in a um, in a Docker container. It detects the four terabyte SATA SSD that I've plugged into it. I've set up a Samba share. Um, I was able to f- figure it out with, through my own web searches and googling around and uh so all of that is working and i was able to drag over my media over to uh jellyfin and all all of that is working my last hurdle um that i I just haven't got around to tackling but i'm sure i'll be able to tackle as well is it's fine within my network but what if i'm out and about Uh, what if i want to access my jellyfin on my phone when i'm out and about and so there's several ways you can do it that i've kind of thought about like you can set up a WireGuard connection into your home network, or you could set up something like a uh, tail scale or something like that. Um, so mm. I've, I've yet to handle or tackle that technical, technical hurdle, but everything that I've, I've, I've been able to kind of spend my time to look into has kind of worked out so far. So, so for the most part, uh, Open Media Vault has, has been better for my technical ability than, than, uh, Proxmox. So I think I was probably being a bit too ambitious, uh, running Proxmox. Yeah, I've actually run Open Media Vault before. It's great. Uh, it's the web interface is, is just really good. Um, I've uh, used it in the past as a media server. So I had it running on a Raspberry Pi and it worked like a charm. And I was really just using it to serve completely legally owned copies of uh, <laughs> entertainment media. Mm-hmm. Um ripped from the dvd uh and <laughs> and i was using uh, that and uh, big book bunny don't forget big book bunny oh and big book bunny of course <laughs> yeah all creative commons open source owned material uh that i was streaming to my uh, my tv directly to the tv so the raspberry pi with omv lived in a drawer underneath the router with some like ethernet cables and power cables trailing out of it and that was serving the media over the wi-fi to uh, my TV and the uh, TV was actually plugged into the internet as well because it had like an ethernet port on the back so uh, there was like no latency at all like it was perfect and we could literally just access all the media from the Raspberry Pi just directly on the TV's me- media browser you didn't need any third parties or anything it was perfect and it just worked like a charm out of the box and it somehow well actually I tell a lie we had a Plex media server on uh, the PS3 Mm. or was it the ps4 no i think it was the ps3 but there was plex media server for the playstation uh, or plex media player i guess it was Mm -hmm. and uh, that would access the media on the raspberry pi and i had like a usb enclosure thing with the ssd attached to it so um it worked like an absolute charm so so were you were you you running plex or were you running jellyfin on the well no i was running open media vault on the raspberry pi where the files were and I could remote into it and everything. Oh. I could get a terminal on my phone and stuff like that. It was pretty cool. Oh, and okay. there was like sure. web interfaces yeah. for the torrent application that I was using to download Linux distribution ISOs, of course. And mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it worked like an absolute charm. And uh, then, but then the res- on the receiving end, you could get the Plex app on the PlayStation Store. So we would access that. Um, There was a time, though, where we did use the TV's built-in media browser. I think what it was was I had the Raspberry Pi connected directly to the TV. That could have been it. But I distinctly remember having the media browser, like, on the TV itself, the built-in one, and being able to detect the media just over the network. It was amazing. So the reason why I was uh, raising... uh, So you're just using the Plex media viewer as just a media viewer. But um, so there's there's Plex, there's MB, and there's um, Jellyfin. And Jellyfin is the is the most free and open source uh, version there is. Mm. But yeah, uh, overall, um, quite satisfied. Pretty good success. It's just uh, those have just been my adventures. 
but <laughs> I will get there. <laughs> I will get there where all of my content is able to be uh, played on Jellyfin and I will be able to out and about whether I'm on my commute on my phone or something like that, just watch something and go, this is cool. I'm playing this from my server <laughs> at home. Yeah, exactly. It's uh, it's nice to connect all the things, you know. I, I, I really do, do love that. If any is listening and would like to give me uh, tips, uh, I'm sure I'll be able to figure it out. But if if you're if you swoop in like a superhero and have the exact solution for for any of my problems, feel free to to message me uh, on or ask tag me on Telegram or get me on uh, Macedon if you um, if you find me on Macedon. Yeah, which leads us nicely into linuxlads.com forward slash contact as a reminder you can find all the contact details there so uh i think that uh about wraps it up for this week so um one brief shout out i will give is that i've now been running cache os which is based off arch claims that is it is much faster than um other distros by that they patched the kernel to, i think they patched the kernel to be faster like with the tasks that it does or whatever it's above it's above my head but it decided to give it a shot it does appear to be faster but that could also be that they just turned down the animations in kde and <laughs> it might be <laughs> might might just be a placebo as well but it does appear to be faster and snappier and certainly the most the most uh, obvious thing for me is compared to a fedora based distro which is one what I was running previously it uh, starts up and shuts down in about half the time. So maybe that is just better optimizations about the order in which it does things. So yeah, Cache OS, it's kind of interesting. Yeah, like a solid boot time is really essential. I find that too. If it's any longer than a few seconds, I'm like, what is happening here? Uh, yeah, F- Fedora kind of takes a while. So I'd, I think that might just be a Fedora thing. So I think that about wraps things up for this fortnight. And we will see you again in about two weeks, hopefully with all four of us again. See ya. Bye.